¿Dónde me pongo esto? Tienes un bolsillo o algo. Métete la idea. Okay, we go on with uh, the second speaker of this uh, morning session. She is uh, Melanie Becker from Texas A&M. She will be well. I think you had to well. She will be talking about, about uh, running away in the landscape. Please. Muchas gracias por la invitación de dar una charla. Um, I'm very pleased to be back in the country where I grew up and see how many changes have happened since Catherine and I left 20 years ago. So the topic of my talk is Runaway in the Landscape. Don't we have um, the pointer? Well, I'll do the it's fine. Okay. Um, my collaborators in this work were Catherine Becker, Kumbun Vafa and Johannes Walter. Catherine wrote some papers, uh, a paper in collaboration with her students, Don Yu and Yu Xi, were on a related subject. So ever since Calaviao manifolds were discovered 20 years ago, people realized that the properties of the internal manifold determine the properties of the four-dimensional theory. It didn't take long until models that resemble our four-dimensional world were constructed. However, people also realized that there, is a morally field, there is a, um, that there are morally fields corresponding, right? Good. Okay, that's better. Okay. So people realize um, that there are, um, there are, of course, deformations of internal manifold which lead to morally fields. We can deform the Kähler structure or the complex structure. And as you know by now, flux compactifications are able to determine the morally fields. So what we are going to see today is to what extent modern fields are determined in flux compactifications. So roughly speaking, there have been two scenarios in the literature. First, the, before our paper, first there was the KKLT scenario. In this scenario, what people consider is all possible effects. Fluxes determine for us complex structure morally, non perturbative effects determine for us the Keller moduli, and these remains lift up for us the vacuum. So that we have a nice metastable vacuum sitting here. Then there is a second picture where model stabilization is achieved by only fluxes. It's a geometric construction which is based on supergravity. It's classical stabiliz stabilization of moduli fields at the classical level. This approach was developed by um, the South of Steel development collaborators in the context of massive type 2 A theory on an orientifold. And it leads to compactifications to ADS4 on this orientifold here. What is nice about this theory is that we do have parametric control, meaning that we have a small parameter, 1 over n, where n is the flex quantum number which can be small and in terms of which you can perform perturbation theory. However, we wanted to do more than this. This model is based on a geometric description. Nobody ever told us that the model fields have to be stabilized in the supergravity regime. Second, the model is constrained to have lambda less than zero, ADS4 spaces. Third, the masses of the model fields, as we will see a little bit more in detail later on, are too small. They are for scale of ADS4, of the cosmological constant of ADS4, so the fields are effectively massless. So the goal um, today will be to construct a simple type 2B model in which model stabilization can be achieved beyond the supergravity approximation in terms of fluxes only. So the point is beyond the supergravity approximation because we will see that in some models it will not be possible to stabilize moduli fields at a supergravity level. So let me describe for you the non geometric type 2 model. In type 2 theory, we know that there is a superpotential for the complex structure moduli that looks in this way here, that was determined by Gukov, Fafa, and Whitten. Here, G is the three form of the type 2 theory which is a combination of the Ramon-Ramon three-form and the Nemo-Schwarz three-form. 
the style here contains the extra dilatum. So, um, if you would like to stabilize modally fit in terms of fluxes only, what you have to do is to consider a model where we only have complex structure modally, but no failure structure modally. So, we took a particular model with H21 equal to 84 and H11 equal to 0. However, what this tells us is that the model has no radial modulus. So, it cannot be a, a, a conventional Calavier manifold, it has to be a non geometric model. And the non geometric model is not as strange as my non geometric heat that I wrote on there. So, what we have to do for a non geometric theory is to consider a compactification on N equal to 2 superconformer P3 with a central charge C equal to 9. Alias, you can take a Landau Ginsburg model or, more concretely, an oriented form of a Landau Ginsburg model. So, my goal is to construct this particular model. There are constraints on the model that follow from number one, supersymmetry. And both the supersymmetry demands that the Kähler derivative of the superpotential is equal to zero. The i that I introduced here corresponds to the complex structure modally and to tau, the axodilaton. The axodilaton has got a Kähler potential that looks in this way. The um, complex structure modally have a Kähler potential that looks in this way here. And then we introduce the notation W is equal to W Ramon Ramon minus tau WNS. So if you look how the Kähler covariant derivative of the superpotential looks like, equal to zero, it gives us a condition like this, which fixes tau to be a, a quotient of W Ramon divided by WNS up to a phase. <coughs> the I of W equal to zero, where the I are the complex structure modally, tells us this condition here, where chi I are the harmonic to one forms. So these two conditions here tell us that G has to be of this form here. It is a combination of AI chi I, this object and plus A0 multiplied by this combination here. So these con two conditions are satisfied. If you only turn on the first component, the AIs here, what you get is a Minkowski solution because the superpotential is equal to zero. If you turn on the second component here, we get compactifications to ADS4 as W is different from zero. This part here is imaginary self-dual, which will be important in a moment. This part here is imaginary anti-self-dual. My second constraint follows from tetra cancellation. For a compact model, the total charge has to cancel. So let me consider for now Minkowski vacua, which were the ones containing the first coefficient I had a moment ago. Then the capital cancellation condition tells me that the wedge product of H1 with H number of swats has to be equal to an orientable charge. The reason being that for Minkowski vacua, the left hand side here is always posit positive definite. I said it's an imaginary self dual. So that we need um, an orientable charge in order to cancel the charge coming from H1 uh, and H number of swats. So the negative of three plane charge is provided by your defaults of Landau Ginsburg models. So what is the default of a Landau Ginsburg model? The Landau Ginsburg model uh, is constructed in terms of nine copies of a C equal to one minimal model. The voltage superpotential of this theory looks in this way here. So it's assumed this I runs over each of the minimal models of nine of them with a superpotential that looks in this way at the Fermat point. So it's a particular point in the Moly space. And what we would like to do is to divide out by an ordinary projection that looks in this way here, that identifies the space and coordinates in this way here. This omega is um, the third root of unity. In this theory, modular fields correspond to primary fields in the conformal field theory. So how do this um, primary, uh, this moduli fields concretely look like the primary fields. We have got, of course, two sectors. We have a conformal field theory. We have got two sectors, um, the Nevers-Schwarz sector and the Ramon sector. In the Nevers-Schwarz sector, we have got the CC ring. 
which, des uh, which describes primary primary fields of the steering and is described in terms of the Jacobian ring. This describes the complex structure deformations. So the Jacobian ring is something that looks in this way here. It's the product of all combinations we can build polynomials with complex coefficients that is invariant under Z3. So the first one here will describe for us the holomorphic three form. These are the two one forms, these are the one two forms, and this is the complex conjugate of the holomorphic three form. Furthermore, in the Neva Schwartz sector, we have got scalar structure deformations, which correspond to primary fields in the A steering and that come from tested sectors of the orbifold. Since we do have a Z3 orbifold, the twisted sectors are very simple. You only have two elements corresponding to H00 equal to 1 and H33 equal to 1. The states in the Neville Schwartz sector are related to the states in the Ramon Ramon sector by spectral flow. And these are the states that we are going to consider in a moment. So, how does the Urian default action then look like? Sources of negative charge are obtained by orientifolding the model that I introduced a moment ago. Orientifolding acts on the space time coordinates in this way here. It's the product of um, an involution times a world sheet parity which reverses the sine of sigma. The involution set is 5p squared equal to 1. So the question is what are the allowed involutions? The, for, in order to figure this out, we take into account that the world sheet action has an F term, which looks in this way here, it's a superpotential. And under the orientifold action of the superpotential under sigma, this um, sigma goes to minus sigma, the superpotential catches up a sign. So which means that the, that the involution acting on X, W has to be um, odd under the, under the involution. So what are the possible involutions that we can have? We can, um, there are five types of involutions that are allowed that correspond to an overall sign flip in all the five involutions that I didn't write down <coughs> all of them. And, and, and pairwise exchange of lambda Ginsburg coordinates. Alias in this way here, we identify all coordinates with a minus sign. These are the same coordinates. Here, we take these coordinates here, put a minus sign here, and identify x1 and x2. And in the next one, we will identify x2 and x1, x3 and x4, and so on and so forth, all possible permutations. The real default action we should be interested in is the second one here, which will give us a three-plane charge. State should be invariant under the Sorian default action up to a sign, which means we can construct out of the 84 states that I had a moment ago, which correspond to the two one forms, I can construct the states here, which are invariant under the real default action. We can have x1 and x2 in the first thing, in the uh, row of x1 and x2, this combination here, which doesn't contain x1 and x2 at all, or a combination like this, which means out of the 84 states, we are left with 66 63 states after re-antifolding. So now that we do have our, our states, what we would like to do is to construct um, the supersymmetric cycles. Since we're talking in conformal phi theory language, we need to construct supersymmetric cycles in conformal phi theory, or in a log inspect theory more concretely, which is done by equal Orient Vafa. So since we're considering how are we going to do this, we're considering an n equal to 1 on log inspect phi on a manifold with a boundary. The superpotential is an F term that an Suzuki gives a total derivative. The boundary term then vanishes in two cases. Case number one, when the imaginary part of W is equal to zero. This corresponds to the so-called A cycles, which in geometric language correspond to special Lagrangian submanifolds. They are odd cycles, and in the W plane, they correspond to a straight line. Then we have the B cycles, which are complex, complex submanifolds for which W is equal to zero, or holomorphic submanifolds. This is a holomorphic condition, so this gives us holomorphic submanifolds, and it's, it is, um, these are even submanifolds. For us, we will have only a point um, in this type of cycle, because H11 is equal to zero. So let me look at a simple example just to illustrate how a supersymmetric cycle looks like 
let's consider one minimal model where Wx is equal to x cubed. Then the lines that give us imaginary part of W equal to zero are these lines here that are painted in pink and which give us three cycles. This one here, the angle here is 2 pi i over 3. Then I've got B1 and B2. What we obviously see from this picture is that the sum of the three cycles is equal to zero. So we see always this contributions here cancel out. Which tells us that all three cycles are not independent, just two of them are independent. And what we need to do is to build all possible Z3 invariant combinations of these two cycles and consider nine minimal models instead of one minimal model. So what we would like to do is to integrate the Ramon Ramon down states, which are said constitute a biases, which look in this way here. So it's a, let me denote them with a bracket like this. And the L can be one or two, um, depending on what primary fields we have. And we would like to integrate those states over A cycles that I introduced a moment ago. So how can we do this? There is a natural pairing that defines the integration of states over cycles. This pairing looks in this way here. It was introduced by Chakotay, Ori, and Rafa. So if we take this pairing into account, we can write, for example, the tabular cancellation condition in terms of this pairing here, where the i that I introduced here is the intersection matrix. So at this point, we have all the tools we need in order to um, construct our model. We have our state, we have our cycles. So the question is, let's construct with these tools the concrete model. Let me summarize again the conditions that we have for now. Uh, we have, let me consider Minkowski solutions. For Minkowski solutions, we do have constraints from supersymmetry. These are these constraints here. Remember that the G, the G has to be at one form in order to um, satisfy supersymmetry, which means these conditions here are satisfied. Then we have a second constraint which follows from tadpole cancellation and a third constraint which follows from flux quantization, which tells us that if we integrate G over the minimal basis, minimal integer basis, we get a sum of these integers here, where the NM counts the Ramon Ramon flux number and the MN counts the Nemo Schwarz flux number. So if we take the flux quantization condition into account and our conditions here falling from supersymmetry, what we get is a large system of Defantin equations. These are equations for the integers, the flux quantum numbers. We are going to put in by hand the um, value of the, model in, of the complex structure model, and we obtain equations for the flux quantum numbers m and n. And the Fantin equations are general, very, very hard to solve because there are equations for the integers. So we are lucky that we find a solution at all. So let us look at a sample solution that we have found. First of all, we realized that all Minkowski solutions we could find are, Minkowski, are solutions that are strong coupling. In, in the, not in this particular model, but in a, a little bit more, um, in a second model, what we found is also ADS solutions that exist at strong coupling. So the precise form of the configuration that gives us Minkowski solutions looks in this way here, just as an example. Here the notation that I've introduced is this one here. The L is given by, for each minimal model, by the L of each minimal model. And here is the notation that I introduced before. The tau for the solution is given by 2 pi i over 3. And if you look at the fundamental domain, at the canonical fundamental domain, the solution is sitting here. So it, weak coupling is going north. So what we see from here is that tau equal to omega is a very strong copy, is as strong as it can be. So, since we do have solutions at strong coupling, the question is why are the solutions why do we um, why are the solutions not heavily corrected? So, what we need to do for that is to look at the flux of potential in very much detail. And actually, we don't need to look at this. Uh, Diagraph and Waffer looked at this before. Waffer and Diagraph and Waffer looked at this, but we looked at it from a different perspective. So first of all, um, what we see from here is that there are no perturbative corrections to the superpotential because the n equal to one action we are dealing with 
as futures of the n equal to 2 theory we started with. We know that in the n equal to 2 theory there is no coupling between hybrids and vectors. Since the dilaton is in a hypermultiplet, we know that we don't have corrections to the superpotential perturbative corrections. There is a little bit independent argument by the authors who also showed that there are no perturbative corrections. Non perturbative corrections are excluded because there are no available instanton corrections. So this ensures the, the existence of this vacua alias the solutions of dw equal to zero are not corrected. So what we know, um, what we know from the solutions, these are solutions that strong coupling and uh, the solutions are not corrected. We can only argue for the existence of the solutions, but we cannot compute uh, quantities like the mass matrix or deal with supersymmetry breaking. For this we need weak coupling solutions. So we start our search for weak coupling solutions. And the goal is to um, search for Valqua with large complex structure and small GS. Some of the solutions are mirrored to the massive type 2A model of um, development collaborators. So what we do is the superpotential with which we started, which was at the Fermat point, we deform the superpotential by this polynomial here. The A1, A2 and A3 that I introduced here are related to the complex structure model of the Tori. So what we will be dealing with is with three um, bulk model T1, T2 and T3 related to this constant here, which will describe complex structure or the complex which will describe the complex structure model of a T6. So in the large um, in the large complex structure limit, our model can be described as a T6. Each of this um, each of these T1, T2 and T3 correspond to the complex structure of the three tori. Furthermore, we will be ignoring the blow-up modes. We will assume the blow-up modes are stabilized at a higher scale. So what we would like to do is to derive the superpotential as a function of our complex structure modeling. In order to derive later on the relation between the complex structure modeling and the quantum numbers, the flux quantum numbers. So let me write down again the form of superpotential. It takes this form here. And what we would like to do is to expand HR and HNS into a symplectic basis in this way here. Special geometry then tells us that the coordinates the ion only space are related to the A periods of omega, while the derivative of the superpotential is related to the B periods of omega. Uh, this prepotential, excuse me, the prepotential is related to the B periods of omega. In the large complex structure limit, the prepotential takes this form here. And since we're dealing with a simple solution, which is at six, the only non-vanishing Yukawa coupling is this one here, between T1, T2, and T3. So if you take this into account, WR takes this form here, and WNS takes this form here. M0, M1, M2, and the ends that I introduced here are the flux quantum numbers. And I've said for simplicity, T1 equal to T2 equal to T3 equal to T. So now we have our form of the superpotential WR and WNS. So right now we are able, we are in the position to derive the relation between T and the quantum numbers in order to find a solution. So now, um, so having W as a function of T and the quantum numbers and as a function of N, we use our supersymmetry constraint which says dt of W is equal to zero, d tau of W is equal to zero, and since we're looking for Minkowski vacua, W has to be equal to zero. So what did we see? Number one, Minkowski solutions are confined to strong coupling. We couldn't find any single solution where Minkowski vacua are present at recoupling large complex structure and small GS. Second, ADS solutions exist for large value of T and small GS. And we worked out specific examples for the solutions. So let's have a look at the, at a simple, at the simplest example for a compactification to ADS4. That is mirror to the massive model of type 2A considered by the and collaborators some specific cases of this model. 
So let me consider a configuration where WNS is equal to N6 or lower Ns are equal to 0. WR is given by this expression here. If we derive the type bar cancellation condition, what we see is that the type bar cancellation condition involves two constants, M0 and M6, while the other constants M2, M4 and M6 are free. This is fantastic because what we see from here is we can send the flux quantum numbers M2, M4 and M6, make them very large, they are not bounded by their default charge, so that we do have parametric control. Alias what we have is some four parameters, one over the quantum numbers, which we can use in perturbation theory, which is great. So if you now write down the concrete form of our solution, which followed from dW uh, d of t equal to zero, the, su the supersymmetry conditions, what we see is that the real part of t is given by this quantity here, the imaginary part of t is given by this expression here, and tau is given by this expression here. So what do we see? We see that since we can send the quantum numbers m to, um, to infinity, m2 and m4 can go to infinity, we see that t1 and t2 can be made very large. Tau2, which is uh, the inverse of gs, can be made also very large, which means that gs is very small. So alias, we have all the reasons to be happy. We found the solution to ADS4. We have parametric control of the solutions. We have small parameters with large complex structure, small GS. The shock comes then when we look at the masses of the model fields. So what we found is that um, when we compute the masses of the model fields, they are proportional to the cosmological constant of ADS4. So this is our matrix of order one. So what it means is that the masses in our theory are proportional, are of the order of the four-dimensional cosmological constant, which for practical purposes means that the fields are massless. This situation is rather generic and holds for all type to B models we looked into, all ADS4 solutions we looked into, as well as for the massive type 2A model of the Wolfen collaborators. So we made a conjecture that any sequence of supersymmetric quickly coupled string wakwa has some model fields with masses of the order of the cosmological constant. So now comes the point why I said at the beginning that it is crucial to understand model stabilization in the non-geometric phase, because for supersymmetric wakwa, model might only be stabilized in the non-geometric phase, which you saw at the beginning. So these are ADS4 and Minkowski solutions. Of course, we can give it another try by uplifting the aqua. And some people have tried, are thinking about this. So the south of here, I've, I've tried this direction. So what we do is to consider a situation where the ADS4 aqua can be uplifted to the serial space. We can uplift the theory by adding these three bars, like KKLT did. However, another possibility to uplift this aqua, which has to be analyzed in more detail, consists in taking perturbative corrections to the Keller potential and non-perturbative corrections to the superpotential. If both of these effects are combined, what we get is a scalar potential that pretty much looks in the same way as the scalar potential that KKLT had one, once they added D3 vibrates which is very neat because what we see is that supersymmetry can be broken in terms of fluxes only. So we don't need D3 bars in order to break supersymmetry. However, this is not a free lunch because all these corrections are hard to compute. So there's kind of a lot of work to do in the future. And let me conclude by saying it's of great importance so, um, to understand only stabilization in the non-geometric phase. Some rather interesting questions need to be solved in the near future. First of all, for the strong coupling solutions that I presented, it will be very important to find a dual conformal phase theory in which you actually can do calculations. For the weak coupling solutions, it should be interesting to see whether instant corrections to W and perturbative corrections to K can uplift the SWAQA. 
It will be interesting to, deal, to consider how to embed Fluxus into a conformal fee theory language, in particular into lambda Ginzburg theory, and the implications of light modeling fields for the swamp land conjecture. So, an exciting trip through the non geometric landscape is ahead of us. And that's it. There are any questions? Yep, right there. Sorry, this is quite a detailed question, but on one of your early transparencies, you had a crucial factor of four in front of the uh -huh. time KOR potential. Yeah. In, in geometric models, that four is actually a one, and I think it's important for your analysis. Yeah. Can you explain again where the four Absolutely. comes from? Absolutely. Yeah, the four is from real symmetry. So if you look at the type 2A model, if you map this to the type 2B model, you get a factor of four, and it's only by four, this non-geometric model is. So it's absolutely, you're absolutely right with that, yes. It, you cannot derive this four in a calypso clan compactification. Any one more question up there? Any volume you can vary to dilute the effects of flux. Uh, again? What, are, what are the masses of the complex structure moduli you lift? Aren't they of order the string scale here? No, of the, or of the cosmological. Yeah, so I didn't. Know, what makes the masses smaller? There, there isn't a volume you can make large to dilute the effects of flux, right? There isn't what? A volume. Yeah. I don't have a volume. It's an geometric theory. So wh what, what makes the masses of these moduli smaller than the string scale? Uh, wh why aren't they of order the string scale? Well, you can actually go ahead and compute the second derivative of the scalar potential, which will give you the masses, and you see that they are of the order of the cosmological constant. Yeah. Okay. Uh, perhaps, uh, Sandy, I, I, <coughs> I could add you a question, because... Uh, uh, Melanie, Melanie, you're, you're yeah. Melanie. <laughs> it's coming from all directions, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes. yes. Okay. Uh, I mean, the, the point is in any one solution, of course, you can compute it, but you're making the stronger claim that in all solutions this is true. I mean, in, how do you argue for all solutions? Because we, we, didn't, we couldn't find any single solution where this doesn't hold for all known examples. In the no, but that's a very weak argument because there are so many solutions. Well, and, then uh, try to construct an example and you get a Well, you can make statistical arguments. What? You can make statistical arguments okay. and they'll show that such solutions exist. They just require very complicated mm -hmm. tuning. Mm -hmm. But we haven't found the, so there's not a single example in the literature where you can find masses that are larger than the four-dimensional cosmological constant. It holds for all examples and the examples that we've studied. Wait, but you have no argument that they don't exist. Can, can, can I make a comment? It, which might, yep. it might help with this, this thing Mike is saying. I, I think in, in, the, in the 2A models that you, your models are dual to, at large n, you mm -hmm. can make a parametric 1 over n argument that what she says is true in the strict large n limit. But in the 2B models, <laughs> the tree level supergravity in fact gives masses that are parametrically larger than the KK scale. What you're saying there is that in the ADS vacua, the Kala moduli, which are stabilized by non-perturbative effects, are generally light. Okay, but, but statistically, I, I suspect you'd conclude that that's not true in general. And I yeah, yeah, in like KKLT, the there is the Kala moduli, but in a non-geometric model without Kala moduli. That's the question. Okay, one more question over there. Yeah. Well, this is more of a comment, but if you're willing to break supersymmetry at the KK scale, then there are enough forces to metastabilize the moduli just perturbatively in a geometric phase, just as a, as a comment, because these non-renormalization theorems are less powerful and you have more independent... Uh, so it's harder in the non-supersymmetric case, of course. Yeah. No, it's actually easier in this respect. You have to... Is you only have to tune... You have to tune uh, terms that are that are different just as powers of G-string rather than tuning a perturbative, I guess, a non-perturbative. Okay, there you can so tell it. Yeah. There are trade-offs. Okay, any other question? There's one over there, yes. Is there any questions? <coughs> uh, you impose as one of the conditions is to have uh, supersymmetry. Mm -hmm. So could you have just relaxed that condition and just get supersymmetry broken right away? Yes, to, in order to get one supersymmetric marker, yes. But you need backward with coupling. Right? Or else you get strong corrections to the equation, to the, to the, solu to the solution of the equation. But that, that's in a straightforward way of, of breaking supersymmetry. I mean, so you just not impose that as a condition, like, like, like in GKP, you don't impose. Uh, well, by the way, I, I, so 
so there are two proposals how we can break the vicinity. One was the proposal to try to develop corrections to the care potential and to the super potential, which will uplift for us the ADS worker to the zero worker. And um, so that's one way of dealing with it. Or you can add these three barbarians. Okay, any other question? Okay, if not, uh, let's thank Melanie again. Thank you.